Hey folks, in this interview, I'm speaking with Laura Tillinghast. She's a commercial photographer working out of San Francisco, California. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I'm here with Laura Tillinghast. She is a commercial photographer in San Francisco, uh, the Bay Area of California. Um, she's a, as you'll see as we talk through this stuff, she's an educator, she's a photographer, she does a lot of fantastic portrait work. And what I wanted to focus this interview on, no pun intended, is uh, portraiture and lighting in specific or specifically about you know one light versus two lights versus three lights versus Rembrandt and all these other things that new photographers have to internalize or should they or should they just start with one or should they just go outside or open a window so here to talk about lighting as it applies to photographing people is Laura Tillinghast hey Laura how's it going hi, hi I'm good thanks for having me you're welcome. Thank you for for uh, taking the time to share this stuff with us because it's a this is an important topic. Like you and I were talking just before I started recording, one of the things that trips up a lot of photographers that want to get into, you know, the art of portraiture or, or photographing people is you know they see their their heroes, their photography heroes, and you know those people are using multiple light setups or giant expensive soft boxes and you know this light and that light and you know all these other things. So they figure in order for you to get good, I have to go buy all those things, and then they end up getting frustrated because they don't know how to use all that light. It's going everywhere. What it, what are you're an educator and you train <laughs> photographers? What do you tell people when they're when they're first starting out in photography in order to sort of not get overwhelmed? Right. Well, what you were talking about initially is I want to say all of those things go outside, use a window, uh, all of the available light that you have to you before you decide to go out and buy light is a good place to start. So if you do have a good window in your home, that works as a wonderful strobe replacement. And depending on what time of day it is, you'll have softer or harsher light coming through that window and depending on where in your house it's facing. But I highly recommend grabbing somebody as a portrait subject and just looking at how that light hits them throughout the day. And then you'll figure out what works best and doesn't uh, work when it's too much light, not enough. And so that's a good place to start. And it's not intimidating at all. Um, going outside is another good point, I would say take your subject into the shade first and then experiment with moving them closer to the edge of the shade where there's light bouncing in. And that's a very, like I would tell everybody to start there. When they feel comfortable in those two scenarios, like they know what the light's going to do at different times a day, then I say start with your um, artificial lights and start with one light. And you learn to use one light in and out and then when you're ready for two lights, you know exactly what to do with the second light and the third light, and you can build from there. So once you've learned yeah, how to use small. one light, yeah, it really will apply to um, multiplying them and figuring out what effects you want and determining how many lights you need for that. Yeah, one of one of the things that I um, as great advice. One of one of the things that that really attracted me to the art and science of photography when I was first learning it many decades ago. <laughs> Just to date myself, it was 1989. You remember that? So uh, I was in the military. We were, you know, I was a photographer. And I'm, when they when you train, train you in the military, the first thing they teach you about is light and photons and the speed of light and the quality of the light. One of the, the things that excited me was kind of getting my brain around the qualities of light. I'd walk, I was stationed in Tokyo first. I remember walking around Tokyo, just looking like a nerd, you know, at shadows and trying to determine what's specular, okay. what's diffuse, what's a hard shadow, what's a soft shadow, what's making that hard shadow? Is is it better to shoot people under a on a cloudy day? It, it, which is kind of the opposite of what most people think. It's like, oh, it's a great day, the sun's out, let's go take pictures, yeah. which is the worst time to take photos. Like people that are doing, that are in that, that Set. Do you recommend that they rewind and start understanding light from a from a physics perspective, or is all that stuff just old school and they should just you know move forward? Um, not necessarily. I mean, I learned the from an art background, and I was taught to look at light in terms of painting. And if you were to paint something, then you start really looking at it closer, right? So say mm -hmm. you have a goblet sitting on a countertop and you go to paint that thing, you're going to look at the light hitting it 
and where it has highlights, where it has shadows, and how that shapes the object itself. And then you start really looking at what light is doing. And so that's how I learned, was to constantly just look at what is the source of light? How is it hitting your subject? Is it wrapping around? Is it hitting and creating a harsh shadow? And then learning to um, mold it and adjust it based on that. But that's how I learned to actually examine light. So the same kind of thing. You learn the hard way if you want to just take someone out into full sunlight and you won't, um, you'll have a hard time until either the very early in the day or the end of the day when the golden hour happens and the sun is low enough on the horizon that you can put someone in full sun and it isn't going to be too contrasty. But otherwise I recommend just trying everything and you learn by doing, you can watch a million videos, but I think you're going to learn it best when you go out and actually try what you've been watching other photographers do. That's sage advice right there, because it's like, you know, it's this we don't live in the world of the Matrix where you could just plug into your head and get information and then go, (laughs) you know, fight like Bruce Lee or anything. Right. Um, You got to do it. Right. And someone told me once I mentioned this in the podcast before someone said uh, that photographers start with like 10,000 bad photos in their shutter finger. Mm -hmm. Right. And the only way to get them out of there is to press the button (laughs) so yeah yeah, so practice 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 um a friend of mine also was was telling me that when he started learning about how to photograph people one of the hardest things is finding people to photograph yeah you can get friends and family and all that stuff but they get tired of you and you know and then they want to see the photos and all this what he did was he got a a mannequin Mm -hmm. and, and or a dummy or something and put it and use that as his subject what do you suggest people do that want to get into portraiture Mm -hmm. but they don't want to you know become that person bugging relatives for to take photographs and practice on right i think a mannequin is a good idea because it's just important that the light versus like a something flat you want to watch the light as it falls across the face and what happens like on this side of my face you see this highlight coming from a window and then it slowly drops off that's what you'll see when you put a mannequin and you know next to a light source and move it closer and further away so i feel like my advice is maybe a little harder but it's jumping in with both your feet i recommend finding other people who are in the same boat as you, they're trying to build their portfolio, but from the side of being a model. And even if you're brand new, they can also be brand new. So find somebody who's just in the beginning stages, and you can do that through websites like Model Mayhem, um, Craigslist. Um, if you're a student, just put up a notice on the bulletin board saying looking for models, do it all for trade. You don't have to pay people at that point. But what that does is get you working with people immediately, and you'll find out Um, when it's somebody that isn't a relative that things will work better and you know when with the relatives they're probably just harder to work with in that (laughs) they're gonna maybe not always listen or you know if it's your little brother maybe he's not gonna listen to you or whatever but with a stranger they're gonna trust you as a photographer and then you're gonna find what works for directing people and what doesn't how to connect with people you don't know and you'll learn this skill set that will help you as a portrait photographer that you have to learn at some point how to get people to open up and be um, their best self in front of your camera. So why not start right away? And then that way you're helping someone else too. They need experience learning how to pose, learning how to listen to direction and how, you know, what photos they look best in the angles. All of that can be something you do with other aspiring artists. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you, Laura, how do you, how do you know when you're good? Like, how do you know, like you mentioned, you know, you could shoot, you know, go to Model Mayhem, find people and shoot as a trade. They give you their time Mm -hmm. and their beauty, you know, in front of the camera and you give them JPEGs. Right. So there's a there's an even exchange. But how do you know when you're good enough to put a price tag on your work and say, no, you're going to pay me or conversely, when should you start paying models, you know, to to allow you to shoot them? That's a really good and difficult question. Um, I think. I'm a hard person with that because I'm super critical and I'm never really very easy on myself. I can do something that other people think is great and I see all the flaws in it. So I would say once people start approaching you, like if you're using a site like Model Mayhem or you put up a website and people start seeing your work and asking to shoot with you, that's when you can determine that you have something other people want and that you can start charging um, or start like negotiating with people if you have uh, I still shoot a lot of times for trade with models who usually are getting paid but if they need something for their portfolio and I need it as well we just give each other that 
courtesy. I don't charge them for the photography and they don't charge me for their time uh, because we're at a certain level where we know it's going to be good portfolio building work. Um, mm. But once people want to ask you to take their photo, that's good enough, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And now, now I'm looking at your website, lauratillinghouse.com, mm -hmm. and I'll link to this in the in the description on this video as well as the blog post. But you've got a broad range of talent and all these photos are amazing you got commercial and product fashion editorial <laughs> beauty portraits headshots um there's fine art in here there's nude in here you're you're across the board how do you like you're what would you consider would you consider yourself a generalist or do you consider yourself a photographer who likes this particular genre but is also good at all these others how do you how do you box yourself or do you put yourself in a box um mostly i just say i'm a commercial photographer because Everything you see on my website is more or less uh, for a commercial application. So I don't do, not the fine art, obviously, but I don't do a lot of, like I don't do baby portraits or weddings or things like that, but I do do lots of environmental portraiture of CEOs in their offices, um, lots of lifestyle work that's portrait based where it's, you know, people using a product and lots of um, headshots. Although headshots, it's weird. I'll go and do like one year where I do a ton of headshots and then the next year I'll hardly do any headshots. It just sort of comes in waves. But I kind of just differentiate myself from there's consumer photography where people are asking you to photograph them to put something on their wall at home. And I'm less that and I'm more being, I'm photographing somebody for it to go um, onto a website into a brochure um, or, you know, into their media packet. It's all mm -hmm. stuff that's got some kind of commercial application. Yeah. Yeah. These are fantastic. We're looking at your shots now for the people that are listening to this. Um, definitely head over to the, uh, to the, to Laura's, to Laura's website or to the, uh, the show episode page for this on the Skyloom site. Um, the, but crazy, awesome work. And when you, when you're shooting, I'm curious about your process. So, you know, taking, you know, the light and the, all that stuff out of the, the equation, all that's done. You've got the images on the memory card mm -hmm. and you're you're back at the computer. Mm -hmm. What happens then? What, what's the what's the flow from just from a high level? I know there's a lot of detail, a lot of steps in there. But from the from the point you stick that memory card in to the point mm -hmm. where you're emailing the subject and saying, hey, go take a look at these. How, how does that part work? I really find that to be one of the more exciting aspects because you get to see your vision and how it came to life and not just on the back of your camera or, you know, you really get to see, uh, what you created. And so I never outsource my retouching to third parties. I've had lots and lots of offers and maybe someday I'll be too busy to do it myself, but I really like being the last person to touch my image so that it looks exactly how I wanted it in my head. So, um, I, have used a variety of programs. Um, my favorite right now is Luminar because I can do so much so quickly. And you used to be, you know, I maybe would start out in Lightroom, do an edit on everything. You know, let's say I have a, a batch of like 90 photos for a client and then I'd move them into Photoshop and do extra retouching on the ones that needed it. Now I'm able to do all of that in Luminar a lot faster. And so I am using it more and more and really only use Lightroom now for product photography when I need to do batch processing on lots of images that are similar to each other. Mm -hmm. So I just find that Luminar, you can take a raw file, do your raw edits, and then go into a creative um, space with it immediately and not, um, I just feel like it's faster and yeah. I timed myself. I did two different sessions, the old way and then using only Luminar and the Luminar was faster even though I had been doing the old way a lot longer. So I just find that as I get busier, the thing I need more than anything is time. So mm -hmm. I'm always going to go to the program that is fastest and I can figure, you know, learn quickly so that I'm not spending a bunch of time trying to figure out how to do it. And how, how are the images, how are you organizing things or on the ingestion side? I know there's a lot of photographers uh, swear by photo mechanic to bring images in and others just say, yeah, I just drag and drop them on my hard drive and throw them in a folder. Some are using Lightroom for digital asset management. What's, what's the, the Tillinghast way? I'm not <laughs> as organized as I could be. I'm always working on this, but I just have a hierarchy of folders and I just go into that on my hard drives and based on the year and the genre of photography, I'm able to find what I'm looking for. So That's it's cool. definitely a system that needs overhauling. But right now it's one of those things where I am too busy to spend a bunch of time reconfiguring it. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you, are you backing up? You haven't have... given me the time to, to do that. Do you have a backup of the images? Are you, are you pushing them up to the cloud or I on do, yes. drives? I have everything on hard drive and then backed up uh, on uh, Amazon. I use Amazon storage. Oh, okay, cool. Cool. I thought you were going to say Backblaze. That's cool. No. Yeah, Amazon Storage is, is, once you understand how it all works, it's really, really cheap, right? To yes, do that. and I got in early, so I had like a really good deal to start with. So now if okay. I move all that data, it's going to cost me a lot more money. So they got me there smart. They hooked me early. And then, then when you're when, when you're done with the edit, you've got them at a point where you're okay with them. Uh, I have a feeling that they're probably never at a point where you think they're perfect, right? <laughs> so. No. Right. You're like the artist that's like, uh, OK, I just got to stop. Right. Yeah, so. and I, I learned to embrace the imperfect as well, because and as somebody who shoots beauty photography, like I get hired by, let's say, a hair care company and they want me to photograph the products, but also with models. And the more perfect that you make these images, the less. I don't know. I don't know. We're not really helping women's self-esteem by taking away every single imperfection on their skin. And so I've learned to pull back on my retouching and really like make sure that people still have a human touch to them and that it's, they look their best, but they don't look fake. So, um, I just find like too perfect is a problem. So it's okay if you let some little things in that maybe I don't want to say flaws, but you know, the things that make people who they are don't need to go away so that everyone's perfect. Yeah. I spoke with a photographer that was his, his mindset around retouching was he would remove anything that, um, was not permanent, like, uh, you know, a, a scar, for example, or acne or things like that, that could be gone, you know, or, or ideally wouldn't be there. Right. Um, he would take those out, but things that are permanent, like he, he said he had a strict rule. I think this was Michael Sasser. I talked to, he's a boudoir photographer in LA, mm-hmm. but he was talking about, um, I asked him specifically about the liquify tool and does he do any pushing and pulling and all that stuff? And he said, Nope, absolutely not. He uh, has a rule against the liquify tool and then mm-hmm. only retouches to bring out what is already there versus trying to make some idealized version of the person. Right. Right. Yeah. You agree with that? Absolutely. And honestly, the liquefied tool I use more on fabric than Mm. people's bodies because sometimes like a collar will go wonky or something. And the liquefied tool is awesome for smooshing it back down and making it lay the way it's supposed to. So the liquefied tool is really good. You don't need to use it on people's waistlines (laughs) yeah, or their lips or anything else. Yeah. Yeah. With great power comes great responsibility there. Mm -hmm. So once you're done, let's say you're done with the edit, you're done, you're out of luminar, you got them where you're, you're happy with them or happy with other people seeing them. Mm -hmm. Um, What happens then? How do you deliver the, the shots to the client? If it's a straight commercial client, I use, um, we transfer a Dropbox and they just grab the files and pull them down. It's not a client looking for a, you know, like a, someone who had portraits taken that needs Mm -hmm. this experience, this emotional experience when they open the photos and see them for the first time, it's more a business transaction. So they just download the files and start looking at them in their own file browser and, um, I'm more or less judging them against the brief that they gave me of wh- whether or not I did well on the assignment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I do still use Infolio occasionally for uh, file delivery to somebody who isn't like, let's say I do a portfolio building with someone and I needed photos specifically for this part of my portfolio and they get high res versions in return, then they can just view on Zenfolio and download as they want. And it's a little bit, um, easier for them than just getting a link and downloading a link. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then like for, like if you're shooting a model, let's say, say here's a situation or a hypothetical situation where it's a, it's a model and you're doing a trade shoot cause you're, mm-hmm. you know, you're just, you want to try a new lighting technique or something. Right. Um, and you want to give that model the images. Do they go on Zenfolio or do they? You just give them a zip drive or or not a zip drive? That's old school. A, z- a folder and a link or how does that work? Yeah, so they get their own password protected section, and I usually check a password that's something uh, private joke between us, something we talked about when. Um, like, you know, I discovered that these people love Kings of Leon too, and so I'll put some Kings of Leon song title as the. Um, password so it's a little bit personalized and then they'll remember the shoot um so 
yeah, that's what I do with whenever there's more of a personal touch involved. I try to do it that way. I love that. That is cool. That's a good idea. I'm going to steal that. I'm yeah. going to steal that. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you, you, something you said just that you just said just sort of triggered a, a question. The um, during the shoot itself, say it's a studio shoot. You know, you've got your light set up, and you know you're you're doing portraiture or a headshot or something like that. What are you? Do you have music playing in there? And and what what is your your mindset behind the kind of music and the the loudness of it and all that? I try to do use music as often as possible. I find that it really relaxes people, and especially people who are not used to having their photo taken. So maybe not a model, but somebody who came in for a headshot and they're you know nervous about it, or they just the first thing out of their mouth is I don't like being photographed. Mm-hmm. Then I try and find ways to relax them, and I always let the subject pick at least the genre. If they if I say what kind of music do you like? Do you want to listen to something? And they blank, then I kind of will push them towards the genre. Um, and then as soon as the music plays, I just notice people visibly relax a little bit just because sometimes things of being too quiet yeah. can be daunting. And so, um, a little bit of music just makes things seem more relaxed and I don't have it at too high a volume cause I still need people to hear me say, you know, lower your chin, raise your chin, that kind of thing. But it has been a good way to bond with people. Like, you know, I really like, um, a variety of music. So most of the time I'm able to connect with people based on what they choose. And then it's a good conversation starter. So if this is somebody who's in hair and makeup, you kind of figure out what they like, get that going and talk to them about, you know, it just will lead to other conversation starters so that you can create a bond with them a little bit before you start shooting. So they see you as a person and they're not as nervous. Yeah, because you're the big, bad, scary photographer who's going to capture these pixels that may go all over the world, right? So yeah, they're, I mean, they're, honestly, they're tense. I, I personally don't like having my photo taken that much, ironically. Mm-hmm. And so when you're on the other side, there's a big lens in your face. And so maybe you're not thinking about who's holding the camera. You're just like, ugh, big lens in my face, and I don't like it. So the more I can um, you know, laugh with them and keep people relaxed, the less I think that becomes a problem yeah put put them at ease that's that whole you know one of the reasons i like photography is because it is it's three main things for me it's one um you know infinite geekery with technology (laughs) and all computers and software and all that Mm -hmm. you can just go to town on that um it's an art form obviously so there's no one right way or wrong way to do anything and it's constantly evolving things are coming into you know, Vogue and going out of Vogue. And then the third piece of it, if you're shooting people, uh, it's um, the psychology of it all. Like everything you just mentioned, like putting people at ease and all that. So you have to, the photographer on the shoot day has to do all that stuff. You got to be technically competent. You have to be an artisan and you have to be kind of a psychologist or at least have some empathy. Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and you do it right. So that's, that's, that's crazy. What do you, what do you do when people come in? to your your space and you're going to shoot them and i know you've gotten this and they say hey laura this is great but you know i want you to make me i want you to make me look beautiful you know or something like that or make me look thin or make me look this what do you what's your response to people that say you know give you even if it's a realistic expectation but they put that in there even if it's tongue-in-cheek what do, what do you say well yeah th- th- there are those people that have unrealistic expectations that as soon as they hire you because you've shot gorgeous models, they're going to also look like, you know, Cindy Crawford or something. Mm-hmm. But they're, they're still going to look like, how do you uh, handle that? Uh, I usually make a joke and say, you know, I'll give you the same treatment that I'd give Oprah. And I have, you know, or something like that where it's all about the lighting and the uh, my, my angles. And I more or less just make a joke that uh, gives them hopefully confidence that I am, do know what I'm doing, and I am going to get their best look. And I say... Also, I'll add one of the greatest things about digital photography is that we have unlimited clicks. We don't have to worry about film. I'm going to throw away all the bad ones. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. start to feel a little trust. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and nothing's going to leave my studio without your approval. Right. Mm-hmm. So well, yeah, that's... Like when someone says that, it usually indicates that there's an insecurity about having their photo taken. And so yeah. they're more or less saying to you, I'm trusting you not to embarrass me, not to right. do something where I'm like, oh, that's awful. And I don't like how I look. So the more that you can. And, and for me, I have to do it in a joking way because I don't have. I, you know, I'm not known for having a huge ego. Let's say I will joke around that, like, don't worry, I got this. I, you know, mm-hmm. and then if I have photographed a celebrity, 
party or something and it comes to mind, I'll mention that. And that way they, you know, I'm like, if, if I could photograph so-and-so, I think I can make you look good. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. How do you, how do you combat the, I don't even know, maybe combat is not the right, not the right word, but the, the increasing sophistication of the, of the world, you know, because of smartphones and selfies and Instagram and filters and, you yeah. know, people making unrealistic or untrue renditions of themselves. Mm -hmm. And then they come to you. Do they have that expectation of, you know, of course I can shoot myself like this and make myself look great. So she's going to do a hundred times better than I could do with my, with my smartphone. How do you, how do you deal with that, that piece of it? Yeah. I feel like most there's, most people just give up control and they say, you are the professional, you know what you're doing, just tell me what you want me to do. And then there's occasionally people who have maybe some control issues. They only like being photographed the way they know to do it with their smartphone from above or um, whatever. And I just work with them more. I talk to them more. I explain what I'm doing a little bit more than I would with other subjects and just try to get them to relax a little bit because the reality is they did hire me for a reason and they just need to remember that that they came to professional for professional photos and to just relax. It's going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're here. Here's, here's a loaded question for you, Laura. You're a, you're a professional photographer. Um, what's the best camera in the world? Which camera should I buy? Cause you've oh, never heard that there's before. There's too many good ones to choose. And if I had yeah. unlimited resources, I would have a lot more cameras just to play with. So I, you know, much to, the chagrin of companies I've worked with, I'm never going to say there's one thing better than others. It really also depends on the person. So I have really, I'm a Canon shooter and I'm locked in with Canon because I started with them a long time ago and I have a ton of lenses. And so I'm all in with Canon, but I recognize that other brands make really good cameras and gear as well. Yeah. And I have a really good friend. We did a shoot uh, where we were both shooting one with Nikon, one with Canon, and we just saw that there were different reasons that we liked the different, you know, like workflows, I guess, that we had. Mm -hmm. And so for him, Canon wouldn't have been as good a fit just because of usability and vice versa with me and with Nikon. So I like to think that if I'm given any camera and I have a little bit of time to work with it, I can make good photos with it because it's really, for me, photography is about light. Yeah, not it's about the light. Tools. So uh, I want to have some Leicas. I don't own any Leicas. I'd like to have some Leicas. There's some really great mirrorless Fuji cameras that I've been eyeballing. And then I always want the newer, better Canon This mm -hmm. above, you know, that they just put out or it's the fanciest one. So I think if you really love gear, you're limiting yourself by saying it's only this company or it's only this this line. Ugh, so refreshing. It's so, <laughs> so refreshing to hear that. Yeah, I'm the same way. I, I, I use the analogy of like James Bond or somebody like that, right? Mm -hmm. So they can, they can pretty much get out of any situation with whatever's around at hand and the photographer should be the same, right? As long as you understand f-stop shutter speeds and ISO and how light behaves, the camera that captures that should not be relevant. You should be able to look at it and, and know what you can do with it, depending on the camera's limitations. Right. Yeah. So I love that. Um, I want to, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about you're an educator. I didn't mention that in the, in the intro and you do a, a series of workshops and things like that. Can you talk about that a little bit? I want to bring your page up here. There's a ton sure. of stuff here that you do. Um, talk about that side of your, of, of Laura Tillinghast. Yeah. I really love being an educator. I just, it's an excuse to talk about photography with other people who are interested in photography and you know we can all relate that our spouse or you know siblings people we live with get tired of hearing us talk but when you go to a photo class here's an unending group you know of people who will always talk photography subjects with you so I really enjoy that and I like um seeing people's photography grow over time. And, um, I like being a part of that. So I teach a lot of, um, local workshops and then sometimes I'm lucky enough to go teach at WPPI or other, um, trade shows, but I do it all the time. Like this year, obviously the quarantine has gotten in the way, but, um, I work with a local camera club and previously Canon had an education center in San Francisco and I was teaching there about once a month, but they closed it last year. So now it's just like, um, probably like six or seven times a year I'll do a workshop. 
I'm looking at you. This page just goes on and on forever. You are busy. So these are all just online lessons. So these are not my live workshops, but they're things I've done in the past for different companies. So uh, I've been, you know, brand ambassadors for several different companies, and they often have you write blog posts and tutorials. So that's mm -hmm. a collection of all of those that are still alive somewhere on the web. Okay, and then cool. what I teach um, in these classes, it really depends. We ask people what they want to learn. And so right now I'm teaching a lot with San Jose camera and video, and they just ask their uh, customers, what do you want to learn? And so lately we've been doing more product and food photography in addition to portraiture which I, is fun because I honestly am doing a lot more of that the last couple of years. And I, there's so many opportunities to geek out with how you do products and food tricks, if you will. So mm -hmm. it's fun to teach people and do fake ice cream and all kinds of um, fun effects. Yeah, I love that. I like the levitating food is, yeah. is my favorite. I love that stuff. Yeah. Um, well, cool. I want to. So let's let's wrap this up. And, and if people want to want to hire you to to either do you know some portraiture or other or commercial photography, or they want to be trained by you, they're a photographer. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to connect with with Laura Tillinghast? Yeah, just reach out via my website. I'm also on Instagram. Um, but yep, that's it. I don't have an agent or anything. It all goes through me. So um, and I'm good about getting back to people. Hopefully, if I'm not out hiking when the email email comes in, I'll get back to people pretty quickly. Um, but yep, just use my website. And if you are interested in my education, check out all the lessons that are there. Everything's free and there's quite a lot to choose from. There's product photography, food, headshots, um, things that are just dealing with, um, the post-production and editing side. There's a little of everything at this point because I, I have been teaching for a while. And I come yeah. from a family of teachers. I kind of always knew some deep inside I would end up being an educator just because it comes naturally to us tilling has. So, <laughs> um, and I've stuck with it because I just it find, to be honest, it's not a high paying situation. I just really enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. You know what I mean? Giving back. Right. And, yeah. and, and it, it, teaching, you correct me if, if, if you don't agree, but teaching is one of the best way to hone your craft oh, yeah. as a, as a photographer. Cause people yeah. ask questions that you're like, uh, okay, well, uh, let me find out. <laughs> right? yeah, no, it's true. And the more that you explain something that you understand, the better you understand it yourself. Yeah. So that's helped with lots of the fundamentals of photography that, you know, you know, things inside and out if you're teaching somebody else how to do them. So it's Absolutely. good to keep your own, you because after years pass, you know, your skills can get a little stale and teaching will keep them fresh. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, cool. Laura, thank you for coming on. This has been yeah. fantastic. Uh, it's always fun to talk to you. It's easy to chat with you. It's always when we chat, it's always like, you know, we're having coffee and just talking about photography. Yeah, I enjoy it, too. Anytime I'm always available. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks for coming on the podcast. This yeah, is, thanks this is for fantastic. Having me. Thanks a lot. This episode was made possible by our friends at Fujifilm. Make images, share stories, and experience moments at the speed of life with Fujifilm. Thank you for staying home with us.